If you have your phone or a tablet or a device like that, uh, you can you can follow along with the, the scriptures on there. It, it kind of causes it to have double work for me at this point to do slides up on the big screens in the room and then also put it on the live stream. So I chose just only to put it on the live stream. Of course, you can open your Bible and follow along that way, but if you would like to see some of the graphics that I'm using, um, the one particular Greek word that we're going to study tonight, uh, that'll be online. So you just go to Vescent Church on Facebook or on the YouTube channel and, and just watch it as, as we're um, having it here. If you were to hit that share button, that would be awesome because that would invite all your friends to, to the Bible study as well. And so I know friends and you know friends and others have friends. And when you do that, it is amazing because people can... Uh, chime in. We've had people from around the world. I, I am just amazed by uh, the people that join us here in, in Buckeye, Arizona. And so, if you're able to do that, if you would um, just, you know, be sure to uh, silence your phone with that little button. That way, it doesn't ring on your whatever ring out during this Bible study. And if it does, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> it's, it's okay if that happens. We're, uh, we're real casual. But uh, in a word, so. Who remembers what we talked about last week? And by the way, we've got different folks here. We got kids at Kids Camp. We got 16 uh, kids that left Monday to go up to Kids Camp in Prescott, and just an awesome group. And was able to pray with them as they were headed out. So, Miss Shelley is is gone this week, and uh, some of that team. And um, so it's it's really um, we're excited for what God's doing up there. Uh, but some people that were here last week are not here, and then some are here tonight that you were not here last week. And so, who remembers what we talked about uh, last week? I'm going to give you a big old hint. Um, Acts chapter 5, it involved a gift. I'm, I'm sparking some memories. Who can... T uh, yes, Mary, thank you. Ananias and Sapphira. And we, we talked about that whole story and there was really one word that I wanted to point out to you, and it was the word agree. They agreed together. And that, that is a power word uh, in the Greek language. It's the word uh, sympheo. And symphoneo means like, it's where we get our word symphony. You come together as a symphony in tune and in accord. They did it in a bad way. They came into a, an agreement to test the Holy Spirit and to test Peter, and that's Acts chapter 5. Um, but there are other positive instances of the agreement, and so that was last week. Well, so tonight, um, just possibly, uh, we might be sharing, I let me say it this way, I might be talking about the favorite word that I have in the entire Bible. This is a powerhouse word. I, I love this word. I just can't wait to talk with you about it. So uh, we're going to be tonight in Romans chapter 5. And we're starting at verse number 12. So it's Romans chapter 5, verse number 12. We're going to read all the way down to verse 19. Now, when... Uh, I'm sorry, verse 21... 12 through 21. Now I mentioned this last week, but just a reminder. So as part of exegetical studies, which is a method, it's nothing more than a method that is taught for Bible students at Bible colleges and then especially if you go to graduate level and study like um, a master's degree in theology or something, the exegetical method and all it means is you go through a series of steps to make sure that you've got the proper context for the verse, um, that you have the, the proper setting, what was happening in the world at that time, in the culture around them, um, certainly what languages were being used. And there's all kinds of different checks and balances just to make sure that when you study, that 
that you can have a, an assurance that you're standing in front of folks and you're you're sharing the truth of God's word. Basically, um, I, Gordy uh, is such a good friend of mine. Gordy, I just love your heart. He's a real fan of hermeneutics. He le that's a big old fancy <laughs> word that means just to bring it to present day application, right? Just to what does this mean for us here today? And so, um, one of the great steps of of exegesis is to try to find out what did the original writer really mean? And so, so there are just really a lot of steps. I mean, you can use, there's actually a resource book um, for exegetical method and practice that takes you through 15 steps and then each one of those steps has sub-steps and, and uh, it's, it's really detailed. But um, I, I love it when I'm able to do that. I don't always get to do that, but sometimes I do. And um, so one of those steps, though, one of those steps is to do a word study. Um, you can choose many words. You can choose half dozen words in a passage as you're studying it. Or you can choose three or what I like to do, it's just for me, and I, I think it's really suggested to do it this way, I like to ask myself, what is one word as I'm prayerfully reading this text, one word that really jumps out to me that I want to know more about. And so um, there's definitely a word that uh, as we're reading through Romans 5, 12 to 21, uh, there's one word that is hinted at as we're reading through the text, but then when we get to it, We'll lock in, we'll zero in on that one word, and that's where I'm really hoping that we can have great discussion tonight, and, and I hope you will uh, you'll join with me in your comments. So, reading in Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and it means Adam, it's in this context, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. I think we need to just pause there for a moment. You know, we can blame Adam. Boy, Adam and Eve, those guys, they blew it for all of us. But the truth is we have all sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. So, um, this, this is a real problem. The whole lot of humanity, all of us, every one of us, sinners separated from God. If it were not for God's grace, there would be no hope. But reading on verse 13 says, To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. Okay, let's just put that in practical words. Sin was already around before Moses came and gave us the text of the law, right? I mean, it was, it was pre-law. That's what he's saying. But he says, sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Oh, but pastor, what about the people in the deep, dark jungle who have never heard the name of Jesus? How unfair that they're going to be judged for eternity. They don't have access to the Scriptures the way that we do and all of that. But here's the thing. God has given a measure of faith to every person on the planet. And to the degree that they respond to it, He, he will be able to judge them. But I, I guess the question is, is not about what about the deep dark jungles. The question is what about you and me? We live in America. We've got churches. We've got Christian radio and Christian television. We're going to be held accountable for the things that we've been given. But anyway, reading along, verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of, uh, from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. So he, he's been using these words. He's saying, Sin happened with Adam. The law was introduced after sin was already around by Moses. But sin reigned all the way from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as did Adam. 
who is a pattern of the one to come. So what he's saying there is maybe they didn't do a blatant sin. Maybe it wasn't like, you don't eat from that tree. Oh, yes, I will eat from that tree. Maybe it wasn't that bad, but still, we've all done it. Where, where we know maybe there's not a command, that there's not a law that's written, in, but we just know in our heart, something is wrong about that. I should not do that. And so we've all experienced that. Now, reading on, it says, but the gift is not like the trespass. The gift, he's speaking of Jesus, is not like the trespass. He's speaking of the sin of Adam. Verse 15, first words. Jesus is not like Adam. That's what he's saying. The gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, still speaking of Adam, how much more? Now this is a huge hint to us right here of the word we're going to get to study here in a few minutes. How much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Verse 16, nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. If, if you can see this in your mind's eye, Here's Adam's sin. And just like alligator mouth, right? Just um, if you've ever studied music, Daniel, you've studied music the way it, when it starts soft and then it gets loud. There's a, a marking for that. Like it looks like a little alligator mouth in the, in the sheet of music. It means it's getting fuller, it's getting bigger, it's getting louder. And so. Is that crescendo? Crescendo, thank you. That's the, that's the exact word I needed. Thank you, Gordy. And so, um, but the exact opposite, where there's many trespasses, but the love of Christ brings justification. All of the sin of the world is drawn into Him if we will only confess Him, if we will only follow Him, if we will only serve Him and believe Him. 17, for if by the trespass of that one man, death reigns through that one man, how much more? There it is again. It's given us a huge hint. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness <coughs> reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? And then he ends with this segment. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification. For who? Justification in life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also, through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Now we get to the heart of the matter, verse 20. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. That's an awkward sentence. The law was given to prove that, hey, you guys, we're really sinners. That's the purpose of the law. It, it shows us we've got a real problem. It teaches us, it instructs us that we've got issues. Um, there's trespasses. But, look at this second half of the verse. But, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Aren't you glad about that? So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace 
might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the one word that I'm drawn to, and I want you to see if you can find it, and we'll look and just see what it's, how it's worded in different, um, different versions of Scripture. It's verse 20. And it's actually three words in English that become one word in, in the Greek language. Actually, I've got that backwards. It was one word in the Greek language, and it, as we transcribe it, it becomes three words in English. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. All the more. And I, I want you to, to see it just visually if you've got your device there. If not, it's fine. But this, this is the Greek word, huper, peri, seuo. Seven syllables. <laughs> Say that one real fast three times in a row. Huper, peri, seuo. Hupo, huper, peri, seuo. So this word, it's seven syllables, but it's, it's a compound word, and it's kind of like the way we do in English when we make a compound word. Um, the, the, the word means, and, and I want to just first, let's start this way. I'd like to read it, how it appears in some different texts. First, here's how it's worded in the... Um, the New English Translation, the Net Bible, which I, I really enjoy. I've talked about it before. It's just full of study notes and just chock full of scholarly notes that you can, if you have it online, you can click it and it'll open up a whole bunch of information about the word. If you've got the Net Bible in a print form, then you, you look to the footnote and it'll, it'll have paragraphs and paragraphs of information. It's worded like this. Now the law came in so that the transgressions may increase, but where sin increased, grace, and this is the way they word it, multiplied all the more. Multiplication. Um, let, let me read it for you in a couple of translations. This is uh, the, well, we read the NIV here in the, in the opening. Um, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Um, interesting, the New Living Translation um, says it like this, but as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. Um, it's an amazing concept, an amazing word. Um, let me, before I get into a little bit of teaching, let me just open it up and just ask, do any of you have any, any comments or uh, any, any questions or anything you want to bring up, any conjecture? Somebody raise your hand, jump in. What is it saying to you so far? Anybody got any thoughts? Well, I've got the Amplified. Oh, would you read that for us? Okay. <clears throat> but the law came to increase and expand the awareness of the trespass by defining and unmasking sin. But where sin increased, God's remarkable, gracious gift of grace, His unmerited favor, has surpassed it and increased all the more. Wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> Can you read the, the first part of that again? I was trying to pay attention to the way you worded that. But the law came to increase and expand the awareness of the trespass by that defining and unmasking sin. Increase the, the awareness yes. of it. That's yes. that's really that just wow that you become that that's what stood out to me. You become aware of this longing and this need. So um, I tell you what, one of the things that I'm just really drawn to is that um, when we kind of think about how um, sin entered into the world and I can just speak from my own personal experience. I know that um, it's really frustrating to want to have victory 
and to struggle. Um, and, and we can, I don't know if you're any of you are like me, but we all, we grow. Uh, hopefully we're maturing as we grow in our walk with God. I've been walking with the Lord for 57, 58 years. I got, well, 51 years I got saved. I'm 58. I got saved when I was seven years old. People say, well, what do you get saved from when you're seven years old? Cheating at tiddlywinks? Or what? I mean, what is, what is it? You know, you played marbles and you cheated for all of What are you asking forgiveness for? But I knew that I was a sinner. I remember at the revival, Brother Parnell, who played the trumpet and he preached, and he, he gave us an altar call and he went down to the front. I gave my heart to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I didn't stray through the teenage years. Um, praise the Lord. I never had any desire to sample drugs or booze or any of that. I just thank God so much. That's not to brag. That's just the testimony that God helped it to not be attractive to me. And I just, mm -hmm. I just walked with the Lord. But, but that's not to say that I'm an angel or that I was perfect because I've had struggles. I, all of us do. Um, the, the journey to righteousness is by the vehicle of sanctification and it requires that we discipline ourselves and that we continually are praying and every day reading the Bible and every day uh, asking the Lord for His help and His guidance. Every time the doors are open at church, we should be there because there is something about this that's so amazing. It, it's like glue to keep us Amen. in our walk with God. And, That's right. and so, um, but I'll, I'll tell you, I've, I've had stretches in my life where I felt very frustrated. Like, man, I want to be a better person. I, want, I don't want to struggle in these areas. I want to grow. And sometimes I've thought, Amen. there's just no hope for me. But then I, I read this verse <laughs> and I realize that Every individual who loves Jesus, we all might think, man, I'm, I'm just horrible. I, God can't forgive this. I, what a mess I've made of my life. You know, I will never amount to anything. But don't you see that God is saying there is an incredible abundance. It, it's no comparison that we, we think our sins are so off-putting and so horrible. If we will only confess and forsake them and turn from them and ask God in sincerity, His grace is far more abundant. It's multiplied to us. So uh, we're going to dig in a little bit. Anybody have any thoughts before we uh, study some about this word? Anybody with any ideas, comments? Okay. Um, uh, sure, yes, Gordy. Go right ahead. Uh, so, that's a little technical, but it's the present passive. Is this correct? Um, sorry. The present, the, is this present passive? I, you know what? What, is, I, what does present passive mean? I'll put it like that, because I'm trying to study Greek and I just... Oh, boy. Well, there's different tenses he's getting into. Like, there's aorist, there's uh, present Past, I don't know. I'll have to. That's a great question. But I think what you're leading up to it, um, I tend to think it probably is in what's called the aorist tense, um, which would mean that an act occurred in the past that has present application and it carries forward into infinity. Uh, I don't have that in front of me in my notes but if this would be a case where it would really fit perfectly with with that form that there's just this uh, a beginning in other words like um, what, what might I compare it to um, we can say where we were when the Challenger exploded what a horrible event we can say oh I remember uh, when Hank Aaron hit his home run to pass Babe Ruth. We, those are events, but those events are not happening now. They happened in the past and they're over and done with. Uh, do they have impact on us? Sure, we remember them, but this is talking about a different sort of a thing. 
if in fact it is the tense you're describing, then it means the grace of God was invoked and it just simply swallows all of the future forward into eternity for anyone who will receive it. It doesn't die. It doesn't go away. It's an amazing uh, articulation of that grace. And by the way, I also believe that it reaches, you know, it, it talked about how from Adam to Moses sins reigned, but there were people all along that journey who expressed their faith in God in the best way that they could. And I think that the cross of Christ reaches both directions. And that there is a grace that is so merciful that anyone who will reach out to, to the Lord uh, receives. Um, I, I don't know if that helps at all. That, okay. Um, did you have another comment? Are you? Are we good? We're, let's, we're good. We'll, we'll come back. Um, so, here's the range of meanings for this um, for this word. Um, and, and again, it's um, it's the the Hebrew uh, not Hebrew it's the Greek word. So you've got huper peri seuo. Um, the peri part is a, a preposition. It means it's like something that you could add on to a word that means in proximity, like with or by or under or beside preposition. And so, um, and so uh, the the perisio part of it, it just means increased all the more. So it's an abundance. So. Um, it's it's a really it's a unique word to translate and, and through the transliteration uh, it comes to us sounding like it, like this if you if you were to think of the word abundance that might be a good way to describe the periseuo part of this there's an abundance but when you when you add huper to it on the front end of it. It's like, uh, it, it's like, is it nitrous? Is, is that what you put in a car? I mean, it just, it just makes the engine explode. You could think of Hooper like hyper. It, it's, um, it is hyper grace. It is super abundance. This is overflow. And so um, some of the dictionaries uh, the Bible say that this word means to be present in abundance. Now, um, Paul sees it as Jesus' way of fulfilling the words that Jesus spoke to the Pharisees. Think about this statement that Jesus made to the Pharisees. Uh, I'm sorry, not to the Pharisees, but about the Pharisees, I should say. So he's talking to a group of followers that just, all they want to do is just love Jesus, serve Him. And he says to them, unless your righteousness far surpasses that of the scribes. That's Matthew 5.20. Well, the scholars who are sitting there and the people that are average, normal, everyday people, they have to be thinking, oh my goodness, there's no hope for me. Unless your righteousness far exceeds that of the scribes, um, but but this this is saying it's what is telling us to to understand is it's not about us being smarter or about us being better or about us having some revelation or figuring something out, but really what it's saying is. All we have to do is put our trust in Christ and give ourselves to Him. And if we do that, then whoosh, there is just this super abundance, just an overflow of grace that it pushes us even beyond the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees and men. They tried very, very hard to obey the law and the letter of the law and fulfill it and gain tithes even from the mint in their garden and, and they had little boxes of scripture on their foreheads and they, I mean, they lived by the letter of the law and they went around telling people you can't do this and you have to do that. And Jesus says, just that simple faith 
is more. It advances you, it springboards you beyond them. Um, and so, uh, here's another definition of Romans 5.20. It, it means to make, to increase, to have overage. Um, but for the wording about God's grace, he, he gives that hyper addition, abounding much more, exceeding much more. Uh, Biblos, which is a wonderful online dictionary, tells us this definition is to superabound, to make to abound. Here's how to use it. I have more than enough. I abound. I increase. Wow, if all of us could catch hold of this, this one power word, uh, the abundance that we have in our Lord. Um, and so the, the word is used um, with, with great freedom uh, in a lot of different translations. If, if you look at this word, uh, how it's translated, um, um, it's, it translates about 20 different Hebrew passages and, and nearly as many Greek passages. Each occurrence should be considered in relation to this original word. And here it, it's only necessary to draw attention to the obscure use of abundance to, sign to signify superfluous. Now, isn't that amazing? Mark 12, 44 um, is, is kind of playing on this. Mark 12, uh, 44, all they did cast in of their abundance, their overage. Um, Psalm 105, 30. This is ironically, when it's talking back about the the pestilence of the frogs in Egypt. This is kind of in a negative way, but it says their land brought forth frogs in abundance. <laughs> Can you imagine? I never have understood Pharaoh. Um, Moses says, I'll get rid of the flies. I'll get rid of the gnats. I'll get rid of the frogs. Well, when do you want me to get rid of them? Tomorrow. Why would you want to live with them one more day? Amen. But there's an abundance. Like, so they had so many frogs. How, how many? This is a picture of how much grace we have. They had so many frogs, they couldn't walk anywhere without squishing them. They couldn't get in the bed. With, they were just inundated with frogs everywhere. Just a super abundance of frogs everywhere. And that's actually the same word used in a negative way for how much grace we have. I mean, we just can't get away from it. It's everywhere. It's, it is just, we're swimming in grace. It's an abundance of grace. Uh, anybody got any thoughts? Is this parking? Yeah, Billy. When you were talking a while ago about how uh, our righteousness has to be greater, far greater than the righteousness of the Pharisees, that's because the Pharisees walked in self-righteousness, the righteousness we have to walk in, the imputed righteousness. Good Jesus. observation, absolutely, yeah. You know, the, the Pharisees, their idea of righteousness was twisted and distorted. Jesus had quite a bit to say to them about that. Our righteousness is trusting in our Lord. Thank you for that, Billy. Good, good thought. Anybody else, any any thoughts? I got a question. Sure, Gordon. Okay. So, when you're going back to the Septuagint and you're using the Greek word, those are all assigned to the strong. Okay. What what tool do you use? Do you use like the Englishman's concordance or what tool do you use to go back into and find all those references? So I well, I I the, would the Strong's is a good one. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned in fact for this ironically on this one I used the New Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, um, those words, and then it, oh, when Collins? I study it. By Collins? Um, I'm not sure if that's the same one then. Maybe it's different. I thought it was the same one, but within the dis de description, within that dictionary, it'll say these words, and I have it buried down in there. So some of it happens that way. Um, Strong's, you mentioned, is a, a great one, but uh, you, can, you can consult Vines. Dictionary. Yes, there uh, that's a really it. good yeah. one. Yeah. Um, 
But the Septuagint, if you guys want to learn some things about the Septuagint, that right there is your man. I think Daniel knows more in his pinky about that than, than I know in my whole body. I've, I've been amazed talking with him. He's very, very knowledgeable about that. If you don't know what the Septuagint is, it's um, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And uh, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but they realized they needed a, a translation for everyone in the current culture, so they translated it into Greek. And uh, and that's what that's honestly what they referred to. That's when um, you know when the New Testament church is talking about Old Testament scripture, they're most likely uh, reading the Septuagint. So. Um, uh, and then Latin comes on the scene, and it uh, it really um, for it really shaped things for many centuries to come. So um, let's let's look at um, this this last little area. Paul takes this word um, that we've that we've been studying here. Let me let me put it back on there. Uh, for you. Um, Cooper Perisic. Oh, man, that's a mouthful. The, um, but, you know, it, the Greeks, they do, <clears throat> they do sometimes have a lot of syllables in their words. I mean, it's a tongue twister. But he takes this word, um, it's a word that was used up earlier in the text, when we're reading Romans chapter 5, the second half of the word was used up in the uh, in verse 15. Episet, uh, episeteo. That part it was in verse 15. But then when he gets down to verse 20, he wants to really make that like I, I don't know, he just wants it to stand out. Well, he adds the who pair part to it, and it, it makes a word that's only used a couple of times in the Scriptures, and, and it really is just this combination of hyper-grace, hyper-abundance of grace, I should say, and, and, and it means to abound more exceedingly. There's, there is one of only, uh, I should say, this right here is one of only two places where Paul uses this word in the New Testament. It seems like, because uh, one of the things I like to do when I'm studying a word is go back and say, well, how was it used? Uh, by, was it used for hundreds of years? Or, or was it used for decades and decades after it appears here in the Bible? The truth is this word, it looks like it's a, a new recent invention. In fact, Paul may have invented this word. Maybe Paul invented words. Uh, it doesn't appear in other places in print form, but he used it two times in the New Testament. And um, uh, the other occurrence, I'd like one of you to volunteer to read 2 Corinthians 7, 4. Would one of you mind to look that up and just read it real loud for us? Um, but both of these letters, 2 Corinthians and the letter to the Romans, uh, Romans chapter 5, both of those are written pretty close in proximity to each other. And, and um, Paul uses this same word um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verse 4. Who has it? Somebody got that one? 2 Corinthians 7, 4. Do you want to read that for us, Gordy? I have spoken to you with great frankness. I take pride in you. I am greatly encouraged in all of our trouble. My joys, in all of our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. My joy, that part at the end there, knows no bounds, is the same usage of this word. Um, <clears throat> man, that we, we should all take that to heart. My joy knows no bounds. It's super abundance of joy. It's super abundance of grace. Um, 
Don't let the enemy lie to you and beat you up and say, well, you're no good and you'll never amount to anything and, and you're just a loser. No, you are the child of God and God has more than enough grace for you to walk with Him. Uh, of course, you know, of course it requires us to, to be walking in faithfulness. Um, I, as I study church history, I think what happens is that the walk that we're supposed to have with the Lord, I see it as right in the middle. But I see the church sort of like on a big pendulum that swings this way and it swings back this way. And so when it swings this way, it might swing a little too close to legalism. Right? Well, you have to be this. You have to do this. You have to say this. You can't do that. You can't do this. Legalism. But then, maybe decades pass and even centuries, and then the church might swing entirely the other direction. Well, who are you to tell me I can't do anything? I can do anything I want. It's all grace, 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 man. But nobody can tell me that anything's wrong. I'm, I'm saved by grace. Well, that's wrong too. That's just as wrong. But when we walk right in the middle, Amen. saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and when God knows that we're trying, He He knows. Look, guess what? God's not shocked that Keith Howard isn't perfect. <laughs> He's not surprised by that. And it's the same with you. He knows that why are you so bothered by this? You're not perfect. And I already knew that. But it's not based upon how good you are. It's based upon how good I am, God says. And so, if we're really trying, and if we're really serving Him with all of our heart, then there is so much grace. So much more grace than we could ever, ever need. Well, I want to... Um, <clears throat> I want to bring it to a, a close here. Um, when Paul, the apostle, considers the multiplication of God's righteousness to the believer, here's what it is. It's grace moving at warp speed. The next time the enemy tries to beat you up, you access the grace of God that moves at warp speed. I mean, it is lightning fast. And it is so powerful. It is hyper abundance. More than you could ever need. You're never going to scratch the surface on it. You, my goodness, He has so much. You're swimming in an ocean of God's love and acceptance. That's the reality. It far surpasses the implications of sin. Adam may have blown it, and we all would have blown it too. And let's be honest, if it had been Keith and Stephanie in that garden instead of Adam and Eve, they would have blown it too. And the reality is, we all have blown it ourselves. We can't point a finger at anyone. We have chosen the choices, but God's grace moves at warp speed. So have no fear, Jesus is near. His grace is exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond what the law requires. And we are swimming like yes. in an ocean of love. Anybody have any thoughts before we close and wrap up the study tonight with prayer? So, basically, God already knows when we're going to screw up before we screwed up. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's right, Daryl. I, that's, wow, that is, um, that's really, that's mind blowing to me that that He does. He knows, He knows we're going to screw up before we screw up. That's. That's well said. And, and yet He loves us. It doesn't bother Him. 
Yeah. Billy, did you have a thought? Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> he knows when we're, uh, we're about to screw up with it now or 100 years from now. Wow. And he's already up there making a way for us to escape them. Yeah, amen, brother. Mm. Amen. Amen, amen. He's going to allow anything more to come upon us what we can handle, but with the temptation, he makes a way to escape. Amen. Oh, that's good. Billy is a walking Bible dictionary. He knows so many verses. I just love you, brother. Appreciate you so much. We are going to close uh, close our teaching tonight with just a word of prayer. I appreciate you guys being here, by the way, because um, uh, you you know I felt like man, I'm competing with J.D. Vance tonight. I guess the speech is happening right now. <laughs> so uh, I I'm gonna go home and watch it. I've got it recording, but I appreciate your faithfulness, you guys being in God's house. And my prayer for you is that the Lord will just give an abundance of grace to you everything you need anything you long for would you just join with me let's let's pray heavenly father we commit our ways to you we need you lord lord do we need you every moment we need you we call to you for your grace we pray for your mercy we ask that in the moments where we can kind of sort of start to doubt if we're really cut out for this walk with you. I ask that in those moments, you will remind us you've got far more grace than we could ever need. You just, you, you don't want us to even worry about that. You have got this. That's a, a popular saying, Lord, when people say, I've got, I've got this. You have got this. And we're, we're not worried. We are so secure in You, Christ Jesus. We're so thankful for Your grace. So honored to serve You. What a delight it is to love You and live for You, Lord Jesus. We pray in Your name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Hope you all have